So my name is Laurentiu Constantin. I come from Romania, Constanza by the Black Sea. I'm an interpreter myself, a uh, translator, uh, and for the past nine years, I've been running my own translations and interpreting company. Uh, it's called New Compass Services, or its commercial name is TIS.RO from Translation and Interpreting Services, TIS.RO. Um, I was asked by the organizers to deliver a presentation addressed to interpreters or to people doing, uh, well, quoting on interpreting services for clients. Um, I was surprised to see that the presentation got included not in the interpreting section, but rather in the sales uh, track. The title I chose for this presentation is Interpreting Interpreters, because I started from uh, an observation that I've made and enhanced over years, that while we seem to be very good, or we like to think that we are very good at using languages and exchanging meaning and information between two or more different languages, we seem to still have a problem with um, being on the same page, as it were, with our interlocutor when we actually speak the same language. Despite the fact that interpreters are linguists, they occasionally forget that Hearing is not the same thing as listening. That uh, talking to someone doesn't necessarily mean you're actually listening to the other, to, to the interlocutor, uh, making yourself understood, and so on and so forth. So using a different language is sometimes uh, slightly easier than using the same language and using the same language meaningfully. This presentation is not supposed to be a, a, a sales presentation per se, uh, but it's hopefully going to uh, deal with a number of practicalities associated with offering, selling, quoting, whatever you want to call that, uh, interpreting services. This is a typical dialogue usually you have that over a phone. How many of you have experienced something like that? There's a caller saying, hello, do you do translations? I know you're a translations company. Do you do translations? Sure, yes, how can we help you? I need a translator. I'm not sure if Russian uses different words for translator and interpreter, good. So I insist on that particular term. I need a translator tomorrow in my office. How much is it? And of course, you don't sell them by the kilo. You don't sell them by uh, inches in height. Uh, you need to know more. So normally, how, how many of you have had similar dialogues with people requiring your services? It's quite typical. Maybe the wording is a bit far-fetched, but the basic idea is pretty much that why we fail to communicate properly from my personal experience is in most cases because we base our communication skills on assumptions, on suppositions. We have a certain mind frame, we expect a certain type of dialogue to go in certain parameters we, you see on the, on the right-hand column, we have our own assumptions, and by our assumptions, I mean independent interpreters, hired interpreters, uh, working as employees in a translations company, uh, project managers, sales managers, company owners, the selling party in this game. By them, they, and theirs, I mean the buyers course. They have their own assumptions, we have ours. It is natural up to a point, but ideally we should be able, we should be aware of these assumptions and we should try to get the sooner the better on the same page, make contact, get the message across. 
typical assumptions on the buyer's side are translators, interpreters, same difference, as they say. They don't really make it. If it's involved with languages, if it conveys messages from one language into another, same thing, translator. Another typical assumption is that an interpreter or a translator is not an interpreter or a translator if they are not able to speak several languages. A typical question or assumption would be, of course you can do several languages, how many? If possible, you should be able to do them in the, at the same time. Uh, another assumption, if you can speak a foreign language, you can also translate or interpret from and into that language. Uh, company managers, how, how often do you get unsolicited CVs from, in your case, people, for example, who've been working abroad? Hey, I've been a babysitter in Italy for three years. I speak perfect Italian. Do you have a job for me? Yeah. Uh, I was a secretary, I was making perfect espressos there. I can speak Italian fluently. Another assumption, and that's a very dangerous one, unfortunately, that particular one is available not just for buyers, but many people in our industry sell or promise to sell services along that line. If your language B, for example, is English, your language C is French, and you're a Russian native speaker, quite often you're expected to be able to run English into French interpreting. In my opinion, and by all professional standards, that's a no-go area. But you know as well as I do that people sell, especially in Eastern Europe, People sell not as much interpreting, but they do sell translations. I'm not familiar with the Russian translations market. I'm pretty familiar with the translations market in Romania. A lot of Western companies buy translations from, say, German into English, performed by Romanian translators. No matter how good they might be, what their language skills are, Language skills and translation skills are, in, well, not entirely, but significantly different stories. Another very frequent, it's last but not the least important, the idea that it comes naturally for a person being fluent in, a, in, in not even fluent, being acquainted with a foreign language, it's a mechanical process. You listen to words into English and Russian words come out of your mouth in, in the interpreting booth. They expect it's that simple. Everybody has two ears, one mouth. Ideally, we should be using them in that ratio. Uh, and if you hear things, you can say things. You have two or three or five languages somewhere in various drawers in your brain. It's just a matter of opening the right drawer at the right time, picking the word, uh, replacing it with a Russian equivalent, and that's it. That's interpreting. We must be tolerant about other people's assumptions because in this business, we're supposed to be the specialists. We're supposed to be the wiser guys. We're supposed to be aware of other people's assumptions, which doesn't mean that we don't have our own. One common misrepresentation or uh, implication that we have in our minds is that people know what they need. If there's more sales people in this room, you know that there's a big difference between what people need and what people want. And the assumption that people are perfectly aware of either is a story about human race and uh, human habits. 
Another assumption is that we know what they mean. Let's make sure that we know what they mean. There's also a matter of professional ego, professional pride. Uh, we take offense when people ask us to do things as interpreters or sellers of interpreting services and they don't have any idea about how complex this work is. Uh, we look down on them if they're not familiar with our professional standards, if they're not aware of what uh, relaying means, uh, if they don't know the difference between consecutive interpreting and simultaneous interpreting and whispering and sight translation and all of those things. They're some sort of Cowans, uh, unprofessionals, yeah, profane world, not raising to our expectations. The idea, the basic idea here is that we must be aware of these assumptions so that we can deal with them, handle them. Do we speak their language? You may be quoting in Russian to a Russian client. But do you really speak their, uh, their language? French distinguishes between uh, langue and langage. English is not very effective that way. They are both called language. Yeah? How about professional languages? And it's not just a matter of vocabulary and professional language. It's a matter of mindsets. Can you, as salespeople, speak the language that can make sense to an engineer who wants to buy your services? Can you, as linguists who are, happen to be interpreters, speak the language that is fit, suitable to the mindset and expectations of a doctor? That's why I call them engineerish and doctorees. And you can think of whatever other names of, uh, Again, we are supposed to be the wiser in this game. We are supposed to be uh, more willing and uh, more open to bringing the dialogue down in their terms. We're supposed to land on their planet, so we'd better start learning about how they behave, how they understand, how they relate to the use of language. In this business, we have to deal with a very special breed of people, professionals, conference organizers, event or How many of you are conference organizers, by the way, or deal in that as well? I should have asked at the beginning. Okay, thanks for not making me feel sorry for calling that uh, professional group a breed of people. Uh, they should know about interpreting. Whoever earns a living by organizing events should also know at least the basics of what interpreting services, whether they're consecutive or simultaneous, uh, uh, what aspects are involved there. If they don't, they have a problem, but we may have a lot of problems too. So you'd better start getting familiar or becoming even more familiar because I'm, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with what aspects conference organization involves. The logistics of organizing an event, even if it's for 50 people or for 5,000 people. Of course, it's also a matter of scale, but the logistics behind that is extremely important. For a conference organizer, there are far more important things like transportation issues, bringing people from airports, railway stations, accommodating them in hotels, catering for their dietary requirements or whatever. Interpreters, oh yeah, we need interpreting. Quite often, 24 hours before the event, they figure it out. And what they do next that's an entirely different story. So to speak engineerish, to speak doctorese, you need to, to be able 
to speak their language in more than one way. To, you, you should also be able to, to get a story ready, to get uh, analogies from their own line of work, from their own professional background, so that they can better understand you. There is another mention there uh, about ideally, uh, the, the fact that ideally in a large company selling translation and interpreting, you should get at least one project manager devoted, a separate project manager devoted to quoting on interpreting jobs. Because quoting on translation and localization is one thing, quoting on interpreting is another. Ideally, that should also be a former interpreter or someone who has at least some basic acquaintance with what is involved in, in interpreting. Now, in terms of project management, here's a, a simple exercise in, in logics. You can never think of everything in advance. If you, if you imagine you can, you're up for disappointments, frustrations, uh, professional uh, tension. You can't. We simply can't think of everything. Human ingenuity is so rich that no matter how thoroughly you're trying to prepare an event from an interpreter's point of view, clients, event organizers, hosts, end users, beneficiaries, audiences will always come up with something new. You're, be prepared to be surprised. Those of you who are actually doing interpreting know that that's actually part of what, why you love this business. Yeah. If you're a, an adrenaline junkie, you love being surprised. You're in the right business. The corollary to that axiom is, okay, you can't think of everything, but that's no excuse not to think of anything. So you'd better start thinking about some things in advance because that'll save you a lot of trouble. Statistically speaking, you can cover most of the situations that, that can come up during an event by thinking in advance by using checklists. I was talking about analogies earlier. Think of what quoting on an interpreting job is in terms of this analogy. We all go to restaurants. You're in a restaurant, the first person you, uh, in some restaurants, the first person you meet is a waiter. In other restaurants, there's a host or hostess inviting you at a certain table, making sure if uh, it's for a party of two, party of five, party of 10. There's two documents involved in a restaurant. One that is seen by customers, by patrons, the menu. The other one is somewhere a, a matter of back office, yeah, the recipe. As a waiter, as a person catering for the needs and requirements of someone wanting to dine in your restaurant, you might be misled into believing that the menu is my only concern. No. For some clients, it's only the menu. For some other clients, more sophisticated or simply more snobbish, they want to know about how the chef prepared their dish. Ingredients, recipe, processes involved. They might want to trick you into getting the secret of that fancy looking dish you're about to pay uh, 2,000 rubles for. Now, as a, as a waiter, you should know what's going into your main room, but you should also be aware of what's going on in the kitchen. When you quote for interpreting jobs, make sure you don't just sell uh, yeah, a name for the service, some meager description of the service, and, and a price. Uh, most salespeople will want to reach to that part yeah, as soon as, as possible. I call them basic tips because I, I in a, in a previous professional life, I was a teacher, and I refrain from teaching people. I don't want to teach anyone anything. People tend to reject 
anything that comes their way uh, as, a, as a lesson. I'm not teaching a lesson. I'm sharing some of my personal experience here. So a few basic tips, if you haven't thought about them, would be, would be these. I referred to that already, distinguishing between what the client wants, what the client needs. Uh, knowing the difference is one thing, and then bringing them close together is another. Of course, the interest of an interpreter in this first topic here would be different from the interest of a, of a salesperson. Definitions. Don't take things for granted. Of course we know what interpreting is. We're in this business. However, we need to define things. It's going to help us, not just our interlocutors. It's going to define our buyers. But definitions are good for us. It clears things out for ourselves. Have a story ready because that's, th th that's actually where I could get lessons from, from those of you who are salespeople. Before you sell, you try to sell a story explaining what interpreting is about. Uh, there are several dimensions to this game. It's not just a linguistic thing, for God's sake. There are so many other elements of time and space and technical requirements and uh, uh, being aware of all the parties involved in that game. We're all fine when we have to prepare plan A, but plan B is always your best friend because plan A is a theoretical assumption. It rarely happens that way. I'll try to wrap it up. I started late, I'm sorry. I'm trying to catch up with things, but uh, always be prepared for plan C. You can always make new friends. Uh, plan B is your best friend, but plan C always shows up. What you need to know before quoting the complexity of the, of the game comes, as I said, from, from the fact that there are several parties involved, not just, link, uh, not just interpreters, but also conference organizers, technicians. You, you need to be aware of, of all, all, all of those things. Conference organizer and beneficiary sometimes are one and the same person. You must be aware of that because there are several decision makers and you need to know what to ask from whom and at what particular time. There's the basic core of content details. What is the field of that event? What is the specialized language that's going to be used? Uh, to what extent are documentation and uh, uh, research available? Do we have the presentations in advance? That's a nightmare for interpreters. When they get 50% of the presentations in an event, beforehand, they're lucky. Location, space details. Try to see as often as possible. Try to, to physically be there to see the location of the event before the event. Otherwise, you're in for lots of surprises. Have you ever found your booth placed in the hallway without direct visibility to the screen or the audience? Has it ever happened to you? Uh, have you gone to an event where they were supposed to, to, to organize simultaneous interpreting and they had no equipment? And you didn't think to ask in advance because you take it for granted. Of course, if it's simultaneous interpreting, it's your job to secure the equipment. They need to know a few things as well. You should brief them in advance. If they're not familiar with organizing a, a, an event involving simultaneous interpreting, you need to brief them in advance. You need to explain in layman's terms what it involves. Make them aware why, if there are several languages involved, you might need more than one interpreting booth, why you need two and not just one interpreter in, per booth. Um, you need uh, visual contact, both in um, consecutive and in uh, simultaneous interpreting. They need to know that they must 
provide documentation in advance. I can't emphasize that enough. Checklists. Actually, this is not a checklist in, in itself. This is a sample uh, uh, PO that we used to fill in for our clients. We made them fill in and sign a PO in advance for, for legal reasons, for contractual reasons, but also for practical reasons, you need to have those things covered in advance. Otherwise, you'll, you'll find yourselves in a situation where they say, hey, but I didn't know about it. I assumed that you would cover equipment. I assumed that uh, you would bring four interpreters instead of uh, two, or the other way around, God forbid. Design your own checklists because uh, I, I made references to, to standards and this is a very short list of, of uh, reference. ISO 2603, by the way, is for interpreting boots. There's a technical standard for boots. If you haven't read that, I strongly advise that you do. It's very interesting material uh, and you'll learn that quite often you work way below the standards. Uh, believe it or not, there's also another standard, I forget its uh, number right now, there's another ISO standard for mobile interpreting boots, like the one we're using now. Um, AIIC, you're familiar with it? Yeah, it's the French acronym for the Association of Conference Interpreters. They have a charter, they have professional standards, they have a, a code of ethics that is mandatory material for anybody involved in this, in this game. Sorry I had to rush things up. Uh, Spasiba.